Um, so I'm here from uh, Consensus. Uh, Consensus is one of the biggest sort of blockchain development houses in the world. Uh, sort of we've been kind of bootstrapping the Ethereum community for the past, uh, I'd say for the past two and a half years. Um, for example, how many of you like are developers like in the blockchain space? Cool. How many of you have used uh, Truffle before? Cool. Yeah. So Truffle is one. I think Truffle is now at about a hundred thousand downloads, and it's like the leading sort of uh, solidity development tool that you can use. Uh, and that's one of the things built by Consensus. Another thing is like in Fura, uh, a lot of the like a lot of the ICOs that are happening in the space. Um, a majority of them use Infura to actually process um, to process the amount of calls that go uh, into the crowd sale. Um, or yeah, so a bunch of infrastructure tools, but also sort of front end um, sort of user facing um, applications. And yeah, one of them is Uport. Um, has any any of you heard of Uport before? Maybe even used Uport? Oh, cool, awesome. Okay, um, how was your experience? <laughs> Um, so it's still like it's still relatively, um, let's say, new tool. We've been developing it for about two years, um, but as probably a lot of you developers know, like blockchain development takes like a long time to to come to fruition. And as the ecosystem constantly evolve, it evolves, your product also has to <clears throat> reflect that evolution. Um, so maybe before like diving into what Uber is, I just want to give you some basic thoughts around um, digital identity itself. There's two things. There's, you can have an identity for a blockchain or for a blockchain system, um, but you can also have, or you can also use blockchain for, for identity systems. So those are two different pairs of shoes. And like we're kind of trying to, to, we're kind of trying to target both. So the one thing is we need for, in order for like a vibrant blockchain ecosystem to work, we need an identity layer within a blockchain. And that basically means identities with private keys are required to interact with any blockchain. Now, most of you probably hold private keys yourself, and maybe some of you have gone through the painful experience of losing those private keys. Yeah. Um, I, think, I think a very, very painful experience. Um, so that's one of the things that we focus on. Within the blockchain space, how do we manage our keys? Because with an identity, if, if your keys are attached to your identity and you lose your keys, your identity is gone. Whoops. Um, the next thing is that we want to persist in identity. <laughs> So probably all of you, and, and essentially if you think about it, a, a wallet is a, a, kind, a sort of identity. And many of us probably have tens or like dozens of wallets um, where we store different things and maybe we have two or three or four MetaMask accounts that we use for different applications and it's kind of all scattered around there. So what we need with a blockchain identity is we need a persistent identifier that doesn't change all the time. And this is essentially is an address. Um, and the last thing is we want to have an easy way to authenticate a user. If I'm a user, I want to log into a blockchain-based application with my blockchain-based identity, I want that to be like super easy. Um, I don't want to copy and paste addresses and like we need to, I think as an industry, we really need to move away from that whole like copy pasting addresses into, into fields. Um, and the other thing is that we can have, uh, we can use blockchain technology to create completely new identity systems. Uh, so now this is, it goes into the real world kind of outside of the blockchain world. Um, and here we can use blockchain to build a self-sovereign identity. A self-sovereign identity, uh, and that solves a lot of challenges that we have in, our, in the digital identity industry today, which is the ownership of identity. Currently, our digital identity is either owned in the majority of cases by Google or by Facebook. Uh, and it's not just the identity that they own, but the, hmm? All the state. All the state, yeah, exactly. And it's not just the identity that they own, but it's also all of the data that is associated with that identity that also belongs to them. The next thing is you have an identity on Facebook on Instagram, on Yahoo, on Google. And so all of these different identities are completely fragmented, and thus um, the reputation that an identity has is basically all the data that is associated to it. Now, those services don't want to communicate with each other because it's not in their interest to share the data. So your reputation is completely fragmented. And the last thing is, for each of those identities, you're probably going to have to have a separate password. So you're managing 10, 20 different passwords for all of your different services. So those are some of the challenges. Uh, so identities today are completely siloed, and they're also insecure. Uh, so your data is, is stored with all of these different, sort of in the government case, with all of these different um, uh, authorities. Each and every one of them is acceptable to, like, to be hacked and for your, for your data to be stolen. Um, each and every one of them has your physical documents that you've uploaded at some point. Uh, you need to create accounts with each and every one of them. Uh, and then when, when they have your data, it's normally very, it's outdated very quickly. Um, 
Cool. So current system completely broken. Um, and we, we're trying to solve this with, uh, with a self-sovereign identity solution. Um, so using blockchain now, we can create uh, secure, cost-effective, and interoperable uh, identity systems. And what they really do is they give the identity and all of the personal data back to the user. So the user is in complete control. Um, we can now attest different pieces of information to our identity, and we can choose what gets attached to it and what doesn't. So those are attestations and claims. Uh, and now I can also verify, sort of, I can verify between a user, like, what, what, um, what data is true and what isn't. Um, also, a user can selectively permission who gets access to data. So, for example, if your insurance company or your bank comes along and says, we want this data or we want access to this data, then you, as a user with a self sovereign identity, get to choose if you want to provide that access or not. Um, yeah, and the last thing is data only need to be verified a single time. And this is something cool. Uh, sort of one of the use cases that I get to later that we're currently working with is um, a cryptocurrency exchanges. Um, I'm sure if you've been in the space for a while, most of you have an account with one of the centralized exchanges. Um, I don't know, Coinbase, Poloniex, Kraken. Uh, and each and every one of them, if, if you have two accounts, you probably, for each and every one of them, you went through a sign-up process where, again, you uploaded all of your KYC information, your passport, and, and now, again, all, they have all that data, but just that repetitiveness of going through that process with each provider, waiting one week or two for a verification email, um, all that falls away because now you hold the data and you, ch you choose to share it. Um, so just from a use case perspective, that's, that's something that we're trying to solve. Um, so what is Uport? Uh, Uport is a mobile self-serving identity solution. Um, and it's also a secure sign-on tool. Um, basically, this is what, um, what, the, what the app currently looks like. Uh, we're live, we're in the app store today. Um, it's just, we just moved from closed alpha to public alpha. Uh, so you can download the app. And basically what Uport gives you is, it's an identity that is rooted in the Ethereum blockchain. Um, you, has, you have a passwordless single sign-on, which basically means if you want to log into a website or you want to engage with an application, all that you do is you whip out your phone and scan a QR code. Um, and in that moment, what happens is you, your app, so your Uport identity engages with that application in the back end. But now for any application that is trying to manage user accounts, they don't have to store any data on their side. Um, and it's also the user's in complete control and completely consents to any transaction that he, he engages with. Um, we have a very simplified user-centered key management. So as a user, you never essentially have to see your contract address or your private keys. Your private keys, and then again, your private keys are not with us. We don't want to touch them. We want to keep it as far away from them as we can. Your private keys are stored on your device in a secure enclave. Um, it's stored, basically, it's stored in the same, sort of in the same enclave that um, your fingerprint information or anything else would be stored on. And in that sense, your private key never leaves your device. It only signs transactions um, with application. Um, so it's super user friendly. And we have, a, for developers, it's interesting, we have a push, push communication protocol. So you can implement, uh, you can integrate Uport into your application. And then um, if, if your application wants to interact with a user, it can simply um, push and push notifications. So you'll get like a verification, hey, this app would like something from you, or like notification. And then you as a user, again, get to consent that something is shared in any way. So a Uport identity is basically a permanent blockchain identity that has a self sovereign identifier. And in this case, the self-sovereign identifier is a smart contract on Ethereum um, to which you control the private keys. Um, then it's also a collection of data credentials that is acquired through everyday interactions. So any interaction that you, that you as a user have with a different application, that data can be attached to your identity. Um, and then it's controlled by the user with the private keys. So at the core, like that's all that there is to the identity. It's the the, the core identifier, sort of the, the address, the data attached to that address, and the private key. Um, and then what the data is, the data that you can attach is basically verified data of claims by other organizations. So in the, in the cryptocurrency exchange example, this could, be, um, this could be, for example, that you have an account with Coinbase, and now Coinbase gives you an attestation that will say, this is a level three verified Coinbase user. And now you can use that attestation, for example, to go to another provider. Or you could have an attestation that says, I am over the age of 18 and I have a driver's license. 
And now I could engage with an application that requires me to have that information, but I don't have to reveal who I am. Basically, someone else attested I'm over the age of 18 and have a driver's license, and now I can go somewhere else and say, well, here's someone attested this information, but I don't actually have to share the data about that attestation. Um, what it also is is just a standard schema on how to attribute different data. So we shouldn't just shouldn't just be a wild like tangle of data, but it should be like there should be an order to it. Um, and finally, if we take all of that data together, this can be this can be certificates. This could be a university degree. This could be when you last went to the doctor. I don't know. It's like it's completely random what you want to test with. Um, but all of that comes together and can ultimately represent a person's uh, reputation, their digital reputation. Um, cool. Um, just just want to sort of run through the basic setup of how sort of this would work on the blockchain. Um, a user has, again, his, his keys on his private device. And this part of the whole equation, the user never has to see. Um, so and this is all running on Ethereum. Uh, there's a, the user has his private keys to a controller contract. Now, the controller contract isn't his actual identity. It controls his identity, which is in the proxy contract. And so the proxy contract is, I think it's about eight lines of code. It's the most simple identity construct that we could create that represents a permanent uh, identifier for, for any user. And it has to be permanent because with any identity that you're creating and attaching data to it, you don't want that identity or that address to change. It should always remain the same. Um, but if it always remains the same, if we want it to remain the same, what happens if the user loses his phone? Then his private keys are gone because it's all, it's all on there. So that's where we have the controller contract. The controller contract has um, a social recovery mechanism attached to it. Um, which is something that we've been kind of trialing and testing for the past year. Um, and it works fairly well. It's basically, you set a social recovery network the same way that you could do it with Facebook. So I could choose, um, I don't know, my parents and my closest friend or my employer or my bank. It's completely up to me, whoever I trust, to recover my identity. And then if I lose my phone, the same way that, you know, you always get those Facebook messages or like those timeline on Facebook, like, hey guys, I've lost my phone again, please contact me here. You could say the same thing, hey guys, I've lost my access to my phone, can you help me recover my identity? And then your core network would just say, cool, we know this is Paul and he needs a new identity. Um, yeah, and so this part, like because Ethereum is so young and still the whole system is constantly evolving, we want this part to be as like interchangeable as possible as we keep updating the, keep updating the design. But that's the basic gist. Cool, so who uses Uport? Um, uh, just um, end users, we have about 15,000 uh, signups for our closed, this is just for our closed alpha, um, which is like quite a decent amount. It's, uh, and you can't even actually do that much with it yet. It's like, you can play around with it, but um, we're really, from an end user perspective, we're not at scale. Then Uport is really for developers to integrate it into their applications. Um, and this is one of our main sort of main focus areas is all of the people who are building decentralized applications um, in, the, in the Ethereum space, but also in the broader blockchain space. Um, that's something I haven't mentioned, like our, our identity follows like very interoperable um, blockchain standards. So even if, I, if, I, if, even if an application is built on a different, different blockchain, we want to be as interoperable with that as we can. Um, and so we work with, we work with Augur, with Gnosis, we've done with Digix, um, Rex, um, Singular, Virtue Poker, uh, we work with Slocket at the moment, um, Project Oaken in the IoT space, um, Colony, a whole bunch of companies there, all sort of looking to leverage Uport as their uh, that identity solution, because then they don't have to take any hassle in terms of account management or recovery. Um, exchanges, I kind of mentioned that. Then um, we've done a little bit of work with enterprises, um, and that's pretty boring. Um, what is interesting though, more and more governments are like actively approaching us to see how they could leverage a self sovereign identity solution like that. Um, and I'll get into like two, uh, two like integrations that we've done. Uh, actually, I'm going to skip this slide as well. It's like different use cases, how self sovereign identity could, could leverage. But um, let me talk about the two government ones. Uh, yeah, so quite recently we did an integration with the uh, city of Zug in Switzerland, uh, which is like really exciting for us. Um, and it's basically the solution that we deployed with them allows citizens to, to self-register 
uh, in the city of Zug and officially verify their decentralized ID by visiting a lo local uh, authority. And the way it works is basically, um, well, the city of Zug was looking for just a login solution for their web portal. And they were like, well, and they were being pitched by like a lot of centralized digital identity providers and this would have come with like, you get a little identity card and like there's a card reader and it's quite expensive, it was like per user costs. And so they, they approached us uh, and uh, basically what we, so what we worked out with them, what we deployed with them was like a citizen of the city of Zug, um, starting in September 2015, can, um, can just make a Uport identity on his phone. Then he goes to the city of Zug's website he says, I want to get my identity verified. Uh, he then puts in his password information and everything else uh, and his, his name. And then that request goes to the city. He can then, two days later, he can go to the Einwohner Meldeamt, um, uh, the citizen's registration office, and just say, hey, um, this is me, Hans Miller, and like, I want to get my Uport ID verified. Uh, and then the lady checks, cool, yes, we received your request. This is really your passport. And then they issue an attestation uh, to that user. That's the piece of data that we talked about earlier. Um, and now, but that attestation and Hexam's thing is not on the blockchain. Because you wouldn't want that piece of information to be on the blockchain. Now that attestation gets issued by the city, it goes off chain, it gets, it gets signed by the user with his private key, but it, it, it doesn't live on the blockchain. It actually lives on his phone again. And now next time when the user wants to log into the web portal of the city of Zug, he just whips out his phone, scans the QR code, whoop, he's logged in, uh, and can then access different services such as um, they're piloting an e-voting e service so that the citizen could actually issue his vote. Now it's being done in a very tame way. It's, they're voting on the, um, the swimming pool opening times in summer. <laughs> 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 so it's, it's like a very slow approach to like, okay, how, how can we work around this? Um, but yeah, like we thought, we thought that was really cool. So this was, we did this in summer and then uh, the other thing, the other project we did that just went uh, public with the Ministry of Planning in Brazil, and they bas they're basically citizens can now upload documents for signature and notarization from other parties. So, can um, be a citizen, I could, I could want to get some piece of information notarized, uh, and we basically implemented that within sort of with, by IPFS with an upload service um, so that the, the document is public. Um, it's, a, it's a private instantiation of IPFS, but it was, yeah. Uh, and in this, what was interesting here, this was a combination of a public and a private chain. So parts of the information that, um, that the Ministry of Planning wanted to share was on a, pub on a private chain, and, but the Uport identities were sitting on a public chain. Yep. Um, oh yeah, this is just, okay, for all the developers, um, we have, we just updated our documentation. Um, like a lot of it is online, there's also like learning guides and like live embedded examples in terms of how you can implement Uport into your application or just like start playing around with it. Um, it's developer.uport.space. Um, we also have a very active developer chat. If you ever want to chat to our team, you'll normally get a reply within one to two hours uh, on Gitter. Um, then we have an app manager. You can register your application and create an identity for your application. Um, yeah, and then we're live on the Apple App Store, and if you want to join the Android testing, uh, that's the link. Do, do you charge anything for developers for getting access to the API? Oh, very good question. Everything is open source and completely free. Any plans in the future? Once we rely on it and we have... Um, no, no. Uh, so maybe, maybe an interesting point, um, we have, we're actively developing an SDK. So an SDK uh, is a, so, um, a software development kit. And an SDK basically allows you to take everything that Uport kind of does and integrate it into your application uh, without using the Uport app. So basically, now you're taking out what, everything that we've done and you're stripping our app from it and our name and everything, and then you have an SDK. And then you can integrate that into your application, and the user would never know that he actually um, he actually used Uport. Um, yeah, and, the, and in that can, in that case, we would charge. Um, and the other, just licensing fee because then you're not using Uport, you're just using the basic infrastructure. The other thing is, I was just going to get to that, it's gas costs. Um, because it is running on a public Ethereum chain, you'll have to pay gas. At the moment, <laughs> we're paying for everyone. Um, over time, you, people might have to pay for themselves, essentially. Or, or companies that would want to, you to use Uport might have to pay for the user. I think ultimately the user should never have to pay and will probably never pay in this whole, in this whole setup. Um, just to finish off, because I think I'm running on time, um, identities have to be interoperable across chains. So interoperability is a huge topic for us. 
Uh, and this is like where sort of uh, Web3 and the Polkadot network gets very, very interesting in this context because Ethereum is currently not interoperable. Um, and the other thing is that transactions need to be scalable to like more than 7 billion people potentially if we're talking about like a global identity solution. Um, Ethereum is not scalable at all. Like try to build an application for more than 10,000 users or 100,000 users, God forbid. Um, so that really needs to change. Uh, and Ethereum does have scaling solutions. However, they're still, they're, they're coming and they're evolving. Um, but from someone, from a point of like, you want to deploy something and get it going, it's difficult. There's proof of stake, there's sharding. Uh, but that's something where we're also really looking to, uh, to Polkadot um, in terms of scalability. Cool, thank you so much. <laughs>